Uh, welcome to today's AgeWall webinar. This is part of our public webinar series on creating the future. It is part four on how to successfully partner internationally to create real world products. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers in just a moment, but you can see them there. I'll give you the very brief AgeWell introduction that you know and love if you've uh, <laughs> come to these webinars before. Uh, this is a new piece to that introduction, and it's just to show you some of the Enveronics polling data that we just released uh, this week, uh, which shows that 78% of older Canadians are confident using current technology. Three in four believe technology can help them in numerous ways, and only two in ten are using uh, uh, tech for health and wellness. So you can see there's a discrepancy there. Um, there's also lots of other interesting statistics uh, coming out of this, so I encourage you to go to our website and check it out. Our vision, as always, is that Canada's leadership in technology and aging benefits the world. Our vision, uh, our mission, it should say there, uh, is to develop a community of researchers, older adults, caregivers, partners, and future leaders. And the goal is to accelerate the delivery of technology-based solutions that make a meaningful difference in the lives of Canadians. So we do consider our network success uh, to this date uh, to be a, a significant one. You can see we have over 700 trainees or highly qualified personnel that are part of this network, network over 250 researchers. Our startup numbers are constantly growing. We've got 35 age-well supported startups, uh, three national innovation hubs, and most importantly, uh, over 4,700 engaged older adults and caregivers. Um, across Canada. So without further ado, we'll get into today's topic. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone can hear us. So if you can type in the chat box uh, that you can hear us, that would be great. Uh, and also you can use the chat box for questions. You can also uh, use the Q&A function for questions. Thank you, Ian. Um, and before we kind of get started, I want to, I'm going to launch a poll and just to see if you're in, in the room on your own watching this webinar, that's awesome, but if you're in a group, uh, we'd love to know it uh, so that we know how many uh, roughly folks are joining us today. So our speakers, I will introduce them as you're doing this poll. First up we have Dr. Andrew Sixsmith, he is the Joint Scientific Director of AgeWell NCE. He is a professor in the Department of Gerontology and the Director of the Science and Technology for Aging Research Institute. These are both at Simon Fraser University out in BC. He is past president of the International Society of Durham Technology and received his doctorate from the University of London. Dr. Lily Liu is the new Dean of Applied Health Sciences at the Uni University of Waterloo. She is also a professor and AgeWell researcher. Uh, Lily was previously a professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy at the University of Alberta's Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine. And she's an occupational therapist and holds a PhD from McGill University. So two very impressive individuals here to talk to you today. Uh, and I will uh, pass it over to uh, Andrew, uh, who should have control still of the slides. Take it away, Andrew. Okay, thank you very much, Darina. Uh, so I'm going to um, talk about things in, in general uh, today and then pass over to Lily, who is going to give you uh, more of a, a kind of a specific example of, um, of an international project that she's been involved in. Um, so, basically, I want to give you an overview of AgeWell's partnership approach and its strategy going forward, um, and to talk about the importance of international research, uh, both for AgeWell and uh, for uh, you as researchers, um, to look at where we are right now in terms of international partnerships, and then think about building international part collaborations in the future, looking at funding opportunities, and some of the practical aspects of international collaboration. So uh, there's a lot, lot of things that I want to touch on. I don't think I'm going to get into any of them in any depth. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'll be happy to answer questions 
um, later on uh, when it comes to the Q&As. Okay, there we go, it is working. Um, so just to give you a, a little bit about the background to AgeWell's partnerships, partnerships have been a major part of AgeWell right from the very beginning and we're really committed to working with partners as part of how we want to achieve a legacy for AgeWell and to maximize the impact of our research and innovation activities. So um, the, the partners uh, or the names that you're seeing on, uh, on the uh, screen at the moment are some of the, or are the key network partners that we have uh, within AgeWell who, who actually provided letters of support uh, for our renewal going forward. Some of these are partners that we've had for a long time. For example, IBM have been partners right from the start. Some of those uh, that you might see here are partners that have come on board over the, um, the, the last few years. For example, we have a, a strong partnership with CARP and with uh, other organizations that uh, developed um, as, as AgeWell grew. And then we've also got some new partners. For example, Best Buy Canada is a very recent partner of ours. And uh, um, these, are, these are partners who uh, want to work with us in the, in the coming years, really, to, uh, to um, take forward both Age, AgeWell's agenda, uh, but also their own agenda. There's, there has to be some sort of mutual benefit here. Um, bit more hang on so in total um, going forward uh, as well as these key partners we have partnerships at the project level and indeed we have around 400 partners who are now working with us across different sectors uh, in in terms of the um, of, in terms of the networks of centers of excellence program, I think AgeWell is probably unique in terms of the, the range and the diversity and the scale and reach of our partnerships. Um, many of our partners, as you probably expect, come from industry, uh, working in the tech and aging sector. Uh, a lot of our partners are from the nonprofit sector though, uh, but also 85 um, academic partners, government partners, and other partners. Um, I'm just trying to figure out what, what comes under other, every, everything else. Uh, so, uh, so, so the diversity and the scale and reach of our partnerships is, is, is pretty unique, I, I believe, for a, a network like, uh, like AgeWell. Um, part of our strategy is to connect with partners across all the sectors that play a role in supporting uh, older adults. Um, typically, these have been in areas such as healthcare services, uh, not-for-profits, community ad organizations, advocacy groups. And of course, we, uh, we, we shouldn't forget that AgeWell um, uh, as a network and all our projects within AgeWell uh, have strong relations with older adults themselves, caregivers and families and the informal uh, social networks of seniors because these are crucial to, um, to what we're trying to do. But increasingly what we've seen is, uh, in, in, particularly in the, 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 the last couple of years is um, interest from partners in the commercial sector who may have not been traditionally in the aging tech space. So for example, uh, one of our key partners going forward is, uh, is Best Buy. Uh, so Best Buy obviously has a, a very strong presence in the, in the uh, consumer electronics market in Canada, but they've become very interested in the, um, the the so-called silver market or the seniors market, simply because this is a, a growing uh, market within the uh, tech and aging, within the technology sector. But also they're very interested in not just being um, uh, the um, selling 
uh, technology in their stores, but providing services that are going to really add value to those technologies. Uh, so things like smart home systems, um, personal uh, emergency response systems, are things where they think that they can also provide a service, for example, through, uh, through the uh, providing call center support uh, to, uh, to back up those technologies. So it's very much around having a technology platform, but also providing a, a, a service on the back of that as well. So I think this is something that we're increasingly seeing within AgeWell and is going to be crucial for us within AgeWell to, um, to work with partners like this to have that connection between developing the technology, but also providing that, that, uh, uh, that service um, uh, support as well. So partnerships are actually a major opportunity for our partners. Uh, we often hear about, um, about old age in negative terms, for example, older people as a burden on economies and, and healthcare services. But the so-called silver economy is actually a major opportunity for businesses in the aging tech field. And as I've just mentioned with, uh, with, with, uh, with Best Buy, increasingly we're being approached by companies and organizations who want to get involved with AgeWell. And these partnerships are certainly uh, extending our reach beyond the traditional health uh, focus, for example, direct to consumer um, uh, products and services like uh, like Best Buy, but also non traditional aging tech sectors such as leisure, the workforce, and finan finances. And if you're aware of um, AgeWell's emerging challenge areas, um, I'm not sure whether we've had a webinar on our challenge areas yet. Um, but the challenge areas that AgeWell is developing is definitely taking um, our perspective beyond the traditional core of health and healthcare um, and independent living to look at some of the things that are really important to the broad spectrum of older people um, within our communities. For example, things like leisure. Uh, things like being able to continue to work within the um, within the workforce with the aid of technology, that kind of thing. I just wanted to talk about the importance of international partnerships. As Darina mentioned right at the start, uh, AgeWell's mission is to be a global leader in the aging tech space. Um, so part of this is about the scientific leadership and reputation um, of, of AgeWell. So we certainly expect our AgeWell projects to achieve global recognition. Um, you know, and I think part of that is having um, increasingly getting that global recognition uh, is going to involve us in having international partnerships. Um, I think also, we also need to think about while, it, while AgeWell is concerned with supporting seniors and developing technologies and solutions uh, for the Canadian markets, we need to also think that many of our markets uh, for our solutions and services are actually global. Um, so that's very much at the forefront of what we're thinking at the moment in terms of what, what AgeWell should be doing. And over the last few years, we've actually developed a number of international collaborations. Um, so right now, AgeWell has 35 international collaborations. Um, uh, these numbers are always changing, by the way, but uh, I, I think the latest number that I, I have to hand is that we have 35 international collaborations across 14 countries. So AgeWell is already at the forefront of the international aging tech sector, I believe. But I think we need to really step that up in the next few years. Um, 
So one of the things that we will be doing um, in the next year or so is to develop a formal international partnership strategy. Uh, so we're going to do this with, uh, with our International Scientific Advisory Committee, which is, uh, comprises some very, very eminent uh, people uh, working with the aging tech sector. Um, so our Scientific Advisory Committee includes Robin Tamblin from McGill University. Um, in, uh, and uh, and some, uh, some really key people that have spent a lot of time over the last few years working with AgeWell as part of the uh, Scientific Advisory Committee, including Anthea Tinker uh, and James Barlow from universities in, in London. Uh, Lawrence Normie, um, who's been part of our Scientific uh, Advisory Committee um, uh, right from the start. He's based in, in uh, Israel. And also some uh, new members of our advisory committee, John Samford from Georgia Tech in the US, uh, Ye Lang Xiu, who's from um, uh, Yuan Ze University in Taiwan, and G. Byrne Evans, who's um, um, part of a AgeWell's own Old Rattles and Caregiver Advisory uh, Committee here in Canada. Uh, so we're going to be working with these guys over the next, uh, next year or so to uh, put in place a, 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 um, a, an international partnership strategy that I think will be part of AgeWell's legacy going forward. So um, th this is something that we definitely will be working on more and more over the, the coming year and to really connect with our community, uh, with researchers, with our partners um, over the next year and beyond. I think also we need to see that AgeWell is already recognized as a forerunner in the training sector, which is uh, really important to AgeWell. Um, what, one of the things that we, uh, we often say within AgeWell is that uh, innovation is about people. Um, and certainly the EPIC training program is really part of our innovation program. Uh, and certainly AgeWell is recognized as a forerunner uh, um, in training in the aging tech sector. Uh, we have a international trainees uh, within the EPIC program um, and through our HQP affiliates in the USA, in the UK, from Denmark, from France and Australia. Uh, we have an MOU um, that's just been put in place with the National Innovation Center for Aging in uh, Newcastle in the UK, uh, who brought uh, HQP to our 2019 Summer Institute and certainly have expressed being part of, um, of our training initiatives in the uh, future. So these are again things that we're going to be developing over the, uh, the next few, uh, few years. I just wanted to briefly talk about some of the things that have already been done in terms of international partnerships and on this slide we've got a couple of examples of uh, projects which have been funded under the EU's Active and Assisted Living Joint Program. Um, so the, the, the AALJP program includes 18 European countries, uh, but also includes Canada uh, as well. So this, is a, this has been a really good opportunity for Canadian researchers to get involved in, uh, in international research through the uh, AALJP program. Uh, so just very briefly about these, um, uh, one project uh, which is called Stay Fit Longer, ICT. Uh, the aim of this is to help participants develop their physical strength, memory and attention capacities using a mobile tablet. Um, this project is led by uh, Dr. Sylvie Belleville. Um, a second project involves a groundbreaking study called Vita, VITAL, or V-I-T-A-A-L, and that's led by uh, Dr. Chantal Dumoulin. Uh, so uh, Chantal and her team are examining whether ICT exo games, uh, video games that track body movement, and a dyna dynamometer, a device that measures the pelvic floor muscle force, can help 
women fight in continents. So a couple of very different uh, projects here, uh, but illustrate the potential for how Canadian researchers uh, can, um, can take the lead in, uh, in international uh, projects. Another uh, project um, is, or, or some areas where, we, uh, where, where we've been sharing our expertise with international audiences uh, uh, include work that we've been doing with the United Nations, uh, work that we've been doing with the um, World Health Organization, and in some of the major international conferences uh, that have been looking at the aging tech field in recent years. So for example, in international conferences, the 2017 um, in, uh, International Association of Gerant Gerontology and Geriatrics Conference in San Francisco, AgeWell had a very major presence at that conference uh, in the technology track that, they, uh, that, that was on. Uh, this was a very, very successful um, uh, program within that conference. Uh, probably one of the most successful programs that the conference has, uh, has ever had and really highlighted the, um, the, the, the emerging aging tech sector, but also really highlighted AgeWell's, um, AgeWell's um, uh, contribution internationally. Another example is work that's been done by uh, Dr. Rosalie uh, Wang within AgeWell. Uh, she was invited by the Division of Social Policy and Development of the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, who recently uh, spoke at an event to answer the question, why are digital skills critical for older persons? Uh, last month, she was at a WHO meeting in Geneva to discuss her AgeWell work on enhancing equitable access to assistive technology in uh, AgeWell in uh, yeah, uh, assistive technology in Canada. AgeWell's also been exploring um, partnership opportunities uh, in various countries, uh, for example, the UK, Singapore, China, South Korea. Um, and indeed, many of our startups have participated in some of these visits and have gone on to create partnerships for manufacturing and sharing their real world solutions uh, beyond um, uh, beyond Canada. Great, thank you, Andrew. No worries. So I'll, I'll pass it over to Lily. Uh, and again, I know I know, folks. So we've got one one question so far. So keep the questions coming, okay. and we'll go we'll go back to the questions um, at the end. Just want to make sure that um, we get through the uh, presentation. Okay. So thank you very much, um, Andrew, for that, and uh, also Dorina for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, as Andrew mentioned uh, early on, that um, this uh, second part of the presentation is an opportunity for us to look at one example of um, a pretty organic um, a process, yet um, uh, example of international collaboration that has began recently but took off rather quickly because of um, the investment and the support of AgeWell. So very much this example, I think, touches on um, each of the uh, five objectives of this um, webinar series, that is to, to forge meaningful partnerships, to bring together stakeholders across the province, to invest in solutions across the innovation pipeline, support startups, and also to train the next generation. So um, uh, each of my slides will touch on um, these uh, five bullets that you see here on this slide. Okay, so uh, this particular example addresses um, the addresses the challenge of uh, individuals who are living with dementia and at risk of going missing. This is a very uh, real issue, and um, we know that the rate of uh, persons living with dementia who go missing is increasing, of course, with the rising prevalence of uh, dementia. This poses increasing demands on care partners to keep their loved ones safe or to minimize the risk. And also on first responders 
to help locate and return home safely persons who do go missing. And several factors um, add to this challenge. And these are, there's a lack of coordinated approach to obtaining, storing, uh, using data to address the risks of persons who live with dementia and who go missing. Um, this is very much of an international uh, global issue. It's not just Canada. There's a lack of comprehensive and consistent data collection to allow service providers to develop and to fund programs that meet the needs of people with dementia and their families. And this is in Canada anyway, partly in due, uh, due to the privacy legislation that does not allow, uh, for example, police services to collect or report data on persons who go missing and who are living with a cognitive impairment. This is um, aligns with the Health Privacy Act. Another challenge is that stigma, there is stigma associated with dementia still. This often hinders the use of um, uh, services or uh, strategies such as vulnerable persons registries uh, or um, it also prevents a stigma prevents individuals from seeking help uh, sometimes it even prevents them from leaving their house especially if they've uh, experienced a very negative <clears throat> experience um, you know trying to find their way and um, people have and have received negative um, negative uh, support from or lack of support in the community and then uh, finally, we um, are acutely aware that uh, there has been minimal collaboration across borders to understand what are some best practices or strategies that work in other countries that we can import to Canada or possibly we can export uh, concepts and ideas to, um, to other countries. Uh, oops. Doreen, I might need you, oh, here we go. Okay, so um, this is a success story, as I mentioned, that began with actually two PhD students who are, um, were connected by Twitter, actually, through the age well, uh, an age well member uh, who is a caregiver. I think most people um, online probably know Ron Bellino. So Nolana Neubauer, who um, is a, was my PhD student, recently completed. She was looking for like-minded researchers to share her passion for understanding the risks associated with um, persons living with dementia who go missing. And she met through Twitter, uh, Katie Gambier Ross, who's a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, through this Twitter um, um, messaging, we learned about this um, biannual international conference uh, called the International Conference on Missing Children and Adults. And around the time when Katie was attending that conference, we uh, learned that there was a new stream created to examine issues around older adults who go missing on account of dementia or cognitive decline. So until recently, this has not been a stream or a theme in that particular conference. At the same time, Nolana was connected with prominent researchers in Florida while she was attending the International German Technology Conference. So this is uh, for those of you that are um, supervising students or that are uh, students yourselves. Um, you know, uh, this is one strategy we've always used whenever there's an opportunity for an HQP to attend a conference. Uh, we look around to see what we can, who are other connections we can make so we can leverage that um, travel because travel is very expensive and make these connections. This is one of the re one result of uh, such a connection. And specifically in this case, because that last conference on uh, German technology was held in Florida, we um, asked uh, Nolana to connect with Donna Algase's uh, research group. We learned that there was in fact one time an international consortium on wandering. However, the membership at that time, they had intention to make it intended to make it international, but the membership consisted predominantly of academics in the US. And so the consortium eventually became dormant with um, these academics retiring. Um, and it never really went beyond the boundaries of uh, the US. We established a very good relationship with the researchers who were still um, interested in working on this topic. And then over a couple of teleconference meetings, we, they, re, they supported um, that we rekindle this international consortium. And this time it would be co-led by, um, by this age well group in Canada with um, also partnership um, from the UK. So um, just a, a list of the investment across this, uh, we call it consider innovation pipeline. We received age well core 
we use age well core research funding. Um, Nolana was an HQP supported throughout and uh, we obtained SIP uh, accelerated funding to help us um, solidify and uh, create some face to face opportunities with members of this consortium that we established. We also received some CABI funding uh, spark to um, support the technologies that were in place and various other partners such as Alzheimer's Society of Ontario. The Impact Center was all along a very important partner of ours in some of the work that we did. And of course, the EPIC program and other community um, partners that, um, that were uh, working with us on this uh, concept. So um, as the, this topic was very close to both Nolana and Katie's uh, doctoral work, in fact, it was very difficult to find other individuals across around the world who were doing this work at this stage of their career. So um, with mentorship of um, their respective supervisors and also funding support from HWAL, as I mentioned, and our other partners, we uh, organized the first meeting face to face that took place in Calgary. And you'll see a picture of uh, just those who were, and you know, we had police officers come to this, to Calgary to this meeting from Ottawa. We uh, also had several partners um, call in on uh, technology. So we had them in real time. So the, the TV screen was full of these partners. And it was, this was followed by um, a conference in Edinburgh. Um, sorry, a network uh, meeting, consortium meeting. And then uh, we piggybacked on the conference in Liverpool on miss, the fourth international conference on missing children and older adults, and adults, I should say, and uh, establish a meeting there as well. The, we found throughout this that um, our most uh, challenging, there was a, not a lack of enthusiasm in participation. Many um, obtained their own funding or were able to support um, this initiative through, um, through matching funds that they brought to the table. But uh, our single biggest challenge is um, having meetings with, um, with Australia and Asia and, uh, and uh, New Zealand because the, it just is not feasible in terms of real time and, and due to the time zone differences. But we, con we continue to hold separate meetings and then we merge the uh, minutes or the documents. So that's how we've dealt with that. We also try and record the meetings for them. Um, the community, is, I just want to talk about uh, how we support uh, um, um, startup companies. This is one company that, um, or one startup that uh, came out of the age well collaboration that we um, worked on addressing this particular issue, the challenge of older adults going missing. And this is um, called the Community Area Sober Alert app that was conceptualized by um, our caregiver uh, partner, Ron Bellino. He was a caregiver for his father. The app uses community volunteers to help locate persons who are missing within a specified radius um, uh, of the volunteer and also uh, serves as an ex the volunteer serves as an extra eye for individuals on the ground. Uh, of course, we emphasize that the volunteer is not to be a search and rescue personnel. So alerts are triggered by the local police service after information has been vetted and a crime has been ruled out. This is a situation we encounter in Canada because of um, the Privacy Act. We, we can't just um, send out alerts to the general population. On the other hand, through our um, collaboration with, uh, with the consortium, we and when we were in Scotland, we learned of Scotland's Purple Alert, which operates very differently. They don't go through the police. This is operated and funded through, uh, it's nonprofit, but it's funded through an Alzheimer um, Scotland. So it's a community-driven uh, project. They, uh, this month is, um, uh, World Alzheimer Month and their intention, their goal, and I understand they have reached it, is to um, is to have to achieve 10,000 downloads by this month. So clearly, there is something that works there for them, and um, they they we when we meet with them, we discuss similar issues and concerns about privacy, and um, and uh, security. And so this is an opportunity for us to learn what's best practice, what works in another country, and um, perhaps import some of the uh, concepts or ideas to Canada. Uh, this uh, slide shows, uh, this map shows where members are located and currently they represent over uh, 10 countries. Stakeholders include persons living with dementia in these countries. They also include care partners, first responders, researchers, students, community organizations. So this is um, my last slide just to emphasize the impact is really regional to national to global. 
So for example, we have had an opportunity, to, uh, we were consulted by the Alberta um, um, government to uh, help them develop or uh, amend the Missing Persons Act, which they now call the Silver Alert Act. We've been uh, also um, very interested in informing the national petition for Silver Alert program. Um, the uh, International Consortium on Dementia and uh, Wayfinding, which is what our consortium is called, um, has also established a website now. So we have terms of reference, we have guidelines, and we have a process, but we also have a website that is about to be uh, launched, about to be released. We're just going through the logo in consultation with the members. We have done, um, I, we have initiated or um, already, uh, already um, working on some uh, research and uh, practice collaborations. And uh, it's wonderful to work with um, the police uh, services in uh, the UK, for example. Uh, we did not realize that uh, most of them, if not all, actually have undergraduate degree minimum, and uh, lots of them pursue graduate uh, research. And so it's really interesting that they have that expertise to bring to the table, the practice expertise, as well as the research. Uh, we're doing work with our international partners on stigma and also on terminology. The word wandering, for example, um, is still being um, very tightly held onto by our American colleagues. Our um, European or um, UK colleagues do not want to have anything to do with that terminology. So as Canadians, we are, of course, the um, peacekeepers and we're trying to work out what is the best way, best terminology to go forward, um, still respecting all the literature, research literature that still had, that did use the word wandering um, to address this. We've looked at best pro practices and protocol. The Herbert Protocol, for example, is a is a one approach to uh, collecting data uh, like a registry. Registries are used all over the world, um, and uh, so it seems the Herbert Protocol is quite attractive to our Canadian partners. And some of the police services are already adopting it with some minor tweaks. Now we're looking at what are some best practices, best ways to um, merge them so that we don't have multiple protocols going on. And then I talked, uh, alluded to some of the strategies that are used around the world and how we can learn from each other. A third one I didn't talk about is the Swedish Dementia Center. They have a mobile alert system as well that we're interested in learning about. And what I'd like to do is just finish with a quote from our newest um, partner or our newest um, consortium member who is Claire Teague. She is uh, from the National Safer Walking Coordinator. She is a coordinator from National Safer Walking, New Zealand uh, Search and Rescue. And she says, um, she allowed me to uh, use her quote in her email. I'm very excited to connect with other bodies that are active in this field and share learnings and initiatives to support safer walking for all people at risk of going missing in our communities. I believe international collaboration is fantastic. We are all facing similar issues. So sharing initiatives that are supported by experience just makes so much sense. I've been facilitating regional walking, safer walking stakeholder meetings around New Zealand. And this was from one, um, so one of the, uh, these that first learned that the Herbert Protocol uh, from a person who had recently moved to New Zealand from the UK. So here again, not only is this particular protocol um, being picked up by Calgary Police and um, Ontario, some of the Ontario Police Services, but already it's um, it's gone to New Zealand as well. So um, it's just an example of how uh, these good ideas can can move around the globe so much quicker if we've got like-minded people that facilitate and communicate with each other. So, um, so that's my example of an interna successful international collaboration we hope to see grow and, uh, and um, create some very interesting projects out of HWELL. Great, thank you, Lily. Uh, so we're going to go into the question and answer period and I'm going to go back actually a few slides. There was a question for Andrew. Uh, I think it was here and it was a question around whether these numbers are, sorry about that, whether these uh, numbers are global. I believe the first number is global because it says globally. Yep. Um, at the top, but I'm not, I'm forgetting, Andrew, if the, the rest are also, it seems like they would be global as well. Yeah, I, I actually um, uh, looked at these figures the other day because we presented these at Agewell's renewal 
uh, presentation um, to the uh, to the federal government. Uh, yeah, they're they're global figures. The the one that looks a bit strange is this one uh, at the bottom: global market for home support technologies. Um, what that refers to are very specific technologies, which are which are often called tele telecare technologies. Uh, so the so telecare is a word that is particularly used in um, in Europe um, uh, to look at the sort of emergency response systems, you know, like Philips Lifeline or Tunstall, um, Tunstall Health uh, uh, um, emergency response system. So that current market is around 10.3 billion uh, globally. Uh, the baby boomers um, spending power is, is looking at the, uh, the, the global um, sort of uh, presence of baby boomers um, uh, globally within the economy. Um, so yeah, that, I think that currently the silver, uh, the silver economy is round about 7 trillion, uh, but that's going to grow to 15 trillion um, in over the next, uh, next couple of years. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And as we, so we have a, a couple of questions that have come in through the Q&A, so I'll get to those. Um, and I want to thank both of our presenters for being very concise and on time. Uh, and I want to encourage you to fill out our um, evaluation survey. It's not five minutes. It's more like two minutes. <laughs> uh, and it is in the chat box there uh, for you to, to fill out. Um, so we have a couple of questions from uh, Amea. Uh, so there's uh, the first one is, uh, how do you plan to, or how, how do you tackle the different learning curves of different generations and regions or cultural backgrounds for technology uh, of adults and older adults? So I don't know which one of you wants to take that. Um, I can, I can, maybe I can start. I can tell you, um, so this is Darina from uh, the AGEL office. I'm the policy knowledge mobilization manager here. Uh, the, you, you, there's several projects that are looking at that, uh, you, you know, that are taking into consideration uh, different uh, backgrounds and uh, uh, cultural backgrounds and approaches specifically with the uh, requirement by our uh, funder, the Networks of Centers of Excellence program, is requiring us to look at equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we just went through uh, a review uh, this past year of the network's uh, equity, diversity, inclusion approaches, and um, in 2020, uh, you know, if and when we are renewed, we will go and uh, implement some of that uh, in a more systematic way. So think about using things like a health equity impact assessment or something like that at the project level. So that's just just to start. I don't know if anyone wants to add. Yeah, I can uh, speak to it a little bit. Uh, it, it, it was actually a couple of notes that I, I put down here, which are which are really important for any sort of collaboration outside countries, um, you know, where you, you, you're going to be sharing knowledge and probably uh, Lily can speak to this as, uh, as well, is that it, it actually isn't feasible to parachute solutions. Um, and I think, uh, but, you know, that if something works in one country, it doesn't necessarily work in another country because of the uh, a range of issues. One of those might be cultural issues. So a good example of this is, uh, is the area of robotics. Uh, robotics is a very um, strong idea, say, for example, in Japan. Uh, my experience is that robotics is not seen as a particularly positive, in a positive light, in some other countries, um, particularly where I come from uh, originally in the UK and in, in Europe. Uh, so there, there are cultural differences. So definitely we need to be aware of those and having international partnerships, if we want to develop solutions which are gonna have um, international impact, they've got to, they've got to be, uh, we've got to be aware of those cultural differences. The other area where, and, and, and Lily highlighted this in her presentation is that, 
in there may be very different legal and regulatory um, uh, frameworks operating in different countries. So for example, something which might be okay to operate in the UK may not be um, appropriate to the uh, Canadian context because of uh, Canadian regulations. Um, uh, so for example, uh, the uh, Privacy Act that, uh, uh, that Lily was uh, alluding to. Uh, so it's, if, we want to be, if we want to have international impact on, of our solutions, we definitely need to have this international collaboration in place. Otherwise, we're going to make we're going to build things into our solutions which are not going to work in other countries. Uh, you got some ideas around that, Lily? Yeah, I think I couldn't have said it better. Um, that's absolutely right. You've you've uh, said that really well, Andrew. Um, the one thing I perhaps can add is that is that uh, as we focus more on diversity, Canada, I know we're trying to be more diverse, more considerate. We are actually, you know, the more I travel uh, compared to, for example, um, parts of Asia, we are actually much more diverse than they are. They're much more homogeneous. And so as we become more diverse, it's very difficult to, um, to, to be able to, with a broad stroke, say, that, that um, this, this particular individual or group from a particular age cohort and um, a particular uh, cultural background will likely you know, enjoy or find it meaningful to use a particular technology. We, it, become, it comes down to really um, understanding who your target end users are going to be and then really very much including them because, um, and also one solution that may, um, may work really well right now may not work um, for in 10 years for the same uh, age category or, or cohort so um, things evolve technologies involve and um, I, I guess a, a case in point is you know we at one time had tablets and games and uh, naturally we may, the the way the technology was made and the interface made it much more um, responsive and sensitive you use a stylus it came with it uh, sorry, uh, with your, with your, uh, everyone just assume you can use your finger, I should say. And so um, you don't, you typically, you know, um, don't, don't purchase these, these um, extra features or devices, um, peripherals, I should say. Uh, and then there was one particular individual, she resembled everybody in the cohort in, in our project in every way, in terms of um, gender, in terms of uh, age, um, level of education, everything, but for some reason she could not operate it. And then it was someone totally uh, unrelated to the project who was looking at it from the outside and said, maybe try a stylus. So we gave her a stylus immediately. She caught on and she loved it and she could operate and use it. And it was just, um, she couldn't somehow in her mind um, see her finger as a pencil or as, as, a, as a tool, the way that others grew accustomed to. Sometimes there's these unique characteristics that you just don't anticipate until you actually get um, get the end user or representative of that end, end user cohort involved in the actual task. Great, thank you both. And I think that covers off, I know Amea, that was a two part kind of question for you, but uh, I think it covers it off. I'm gonna go to, uh, back to Linda, um, uh, who's asking, as a startup, what is the best source for stats in Canada for the aging market? Lily, do you want to start us off? Can you just repeat that question, please? Uh, so for a startup, what is the best source of stats, so statistics in Canada for the aging market? Oh, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I think it depends on the tech, on, on the startup. And uh, um, I, I don't really, um, I don't really advocate, I guess, going to any specific database. What we do typically with any innovation doesn't have to be a technology startup. It can be um, any, even a, a, um, a program that you want to start. Um, we consider that to be an innovation as well. Is to go um, go to the um, to the cohort that that this is going to be delivered to or offered to, and uh, always start with a needs assessment. So. Um, 
understand what the characteristics, what the needs are for that particular population. So we did that, um, for example, with the uh, healthcare aides, and we wanted to introduce technologies. These are healthcare aides working in the community with older adults, and we wanted to introduce um, a platform, a hardware and software that was going to meet their needs. The three quarters of the time, um, that the project was funded for was actually invested in understanding their needs and that formed the foundation for us to develop um, then the technology and the content of the end product to match those needs. Had we not done the needs assessment, the product would have been useless to them. So, um, and then that said, that reports out, people can look at it. I would still say it, you can't take that in, as uh, Andrew um, emphasized earlier, you can't take that to um, even another province or uh, another setting or another um, service delivery group and just plop it in and say, this is gonna work for you as well. You would still have to do that needs assessment. Perhaps not, not as time intensive the second round, but certainly always important. Rather than, I don't think there's any set of database that I can recommend that will cover, that will answer all of your questions. You really do need to talk to the end users. Yeah. I, yeah I Go ahead, Andrew. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just want to uh, back up what Lily's just mentioned there. Uh, you, you know, like, uh, there are a lot of great statistical sources um, available for Canada and internationally. Um, you know, StatsCan produces a lot of stuff to do with, with aging. Um, if, you, if you go to the US um, or the UK, um, then again, you know, the similar... Uh, statistical sources there, but I think it. I think from a startup point of view, I think um, the idea of the broad statistics are um, less useful than, say, trying to really see where your product is is really going to make a difference. Um, so, what's who who? What are the characteristics of your market, and then? basing your product around that, as, as Lily said, to try and understand the, the needs from their perspective and then look at, well, okay, if we're going to develop our product, what's our route? What are the potential barriers are, around that? Um, so, so while I think uh, looking at the broad stats, you know, like for example, if you're doing something which is related to dementia, you know, we can, uh, you know, we always hear stats about people, you know, the prevalence of dementia within the community, we can certainly find that. Uh, but I think a key thing is really to try and get a strong idea of who your customer is and to, um, and, and to link your, uh, your solutions to, to, to that rather than the, the, the very broad stats that might be available. Great, thank you both. Uh, yeah, I think in general, uh, as you're saying, you know, Stats Canada, I think Linda's just following up that Stats Canada has some dated info. I mean, we just did, we just put out this Enveronics poll as well from AgeWell, so I would take a look at that. Uh, before we answer a couple more questions, and I recognize uh, there's lots of uh, good uh, questions coming in, but we are almost uh, out of time. I just want to give you a heads up about our next webinar, uh, which will be in November. Uh, it is part five of six, uh, and it will focus on supporting people who juggle work and caregiving challenges and solutions with Dr. Janet Fast on November 7th at 1 p.m. So I encourage you to re register for that, and the registration link is in the chat box. Also, if you're in Munton in October, know that that is where our uh, annual conference will be. I know there's lots of members on this webinar, uh, so we hope to see you uh, there um, from October 22nd to 24th. Uh, and you can register uh, for that conference online as well, and we'll, we'll put in the link. Um, so just to go back to some of the questions, uh, there was an interesting one uh, that came in from Ian, so Ian is asking, uh, has the consortium thought about an internet-based collaboration platform to promote the idea exchange? And then he gave some examples, which I haven't heard of, uh, uh, including Planbox and, or Spark. Yeah, yes, so that is uh, the website that I was alluding to. So right now it's got, um, you know, we're representing each country with a flag and we've got the individuals, um, 
profiles that are being entered and developed. So all the members are submitting that. And uh, that is one feature is the collaboration for sure. Yes, online. Thank you for that. Great. And um, uh, one from Laura. Hi, Laura. Uh, to what extent does AgeWell help connect startups with cohorts of end users to promote co-design of innovations? Uh, so I can start and then Andrew, feel free to add. Uh, we do have you know, a, a business development and industry relations manager uh, and team uh, who help with that. Uh, we are currently uh, working on piloting uh, these kind of insight sessions, what we're calling insight sessions, where uh, some of our startups that are in our network uh, will be presenting to our older adult and caregiver advisory committee. Uh, to, you know, or specifically members who are interested within that committee and participating in, this, in these sessions uh, to give them feedback on their uh, products that they are developing. Um, so that's a specific mechanism that we're doing that. Uh, but I'm wondering, Andrew, I don't know if you have anything to add there. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it's an interesting question. I, um, so I, I I think we're going to put in place a startups affiliate program, are we not, Darina? Um, yes. Yes, we correct. are. So, so that that is uh, w w one of the one of the things that AgeWell is very keen on is promoting startups in this sector because startups are leaner, they're more agile. Um, the the bigger organisations, the bigger companies that are working in this space, so eventually you know not really driven it along uh, as, as much as we we'd hoped so we we are looking at the startup community um, so projects and startups that we're funding ourselves but also startups that are operating within the aging tech field uh, we we want to support these as much as possible that 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 um, startup affiliate startup affiliates program is work in progress but what we do hope to do is provide the sorts of things that the, um, the person asking the question uh, might be thinking about, whether we can connect uh, startups to um, the sorts of really great resources that we have around our, our network, um, you know, uh, and, and to help Canadian startups to uh, re really push their, um, their their ideas and products. Uh, so, for example, one of the big challenges that many startups have is connecting with um, with potential end users. So that might be something that should be something that we're helping with. Another another area might be um, evaluating the um, impact. You know, so when a product is is ready for market, providing some sort of strong evidence base for its, um, its usefulness, its, um, um, its impact, et cetera, et cetera, is something that we can help with as well. So that Startups Affiliate Program is work in progress. We want to uh, provide those kinds of support. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, another question for Lily. Uh, how effective have wearables or smartwatches with GPS apps uh, been in finding older adults who have gone missing. Uh, to date, I have not seen a report from the Ontario Police Services. This is a question from Mary Allen. Um, well, we, we did actually do a, um, a study, a province-wide study in Alberta on various GPS-enabled devices. Um, and um, of all the devices, probably the watch, it was the least um, um, comfortable and um, but they were all, you know, very, very much uh, fav in favor uh, of these technologies. Um, my understanding now is that, um, you know, these are these devices. Anything it doesn't have to be a watch. It could be a pendant. It could be anything that they carry with them. Is only effective if they use it and if they carry it. And so the idea is that there should be a multi-pronged approach um, from low tech or no tech all the way to high tech if you can have it. And that uh, really has to be. Um, including, for example, GPS, um, you know, uh, enabled uh, insoles that they can put into shoes. But again, if you wear the wrong shoes, you won't be, you won't have it. Um, there are many user interface issues with these kinds of technologies. One of which is um, 
keeping these devices charged or powered um, does require um, a, a level of um, you know an, a cognitive ability or uh, caregivers who can so there are lots of issues around the the, the usability of these kinds of devices um, there's a lot of other technologies that may not be GPS related but are now you know people are looking at for helping um, locate people individuals who go missing so uh, if you're talking specifically about watches I think um, I think it's like any any GPS device. There's there's a lot of margin for error and there's some usability issues. But I wouldn't use them or rely on them alone. I would uh, consider other um, like apps that are on if they are used to carrying phones with them. There are many ways that you can use to track an individual and even talk them through finding their way. And uh, we have partners in our projects who live with dementia who have discovered these um, apps and find them um, extremely extremely helpful. Great, thank you, Lily. Uh, and I think I'm gonna uh, do one last question here from Amea, uh, uh, and the question is, um, I would like to know uh, if you could expand on how AgeWell interacts with academic institutions. What are the typical involvements between universities and AgeWell? Andrew, do you wanna answer that one? Um, what, uh, you mean internationally, um, I, pre I presume? Um, I, I mean, I, th I think uh, it sounds like it's someone new, perhaps new to age well, I think oh, generally. Okay. Uh, yes, so, so within, um, within Canada, uh, age well has connections with almost all the um, major research in, um, universities in, in Canada and increasingly we're, we're adding to that. So, um, so age well is extremely well connected within, uh, within Canada. What we're doing internationally is to increasingly put in place um, MOUs which outline shared objectives um, between ourselves as in AgeWell and other organizations. So for example, I mentioned the, there's one in place that we've um, worked on um, uh, over the last year with the uh, something called the Northern Health Alliance in the United Kingdom. Um, and that is partners in the United Kingdom at the University of Manchester, the University of Lancaster, um, University of Newcastle, so the north of England. So that, that is something that we're, uh, we're very much trying to, uh, to um, push. One thing that we m might be considering is that AgeWell does, will have responsive funding. Um, I'll get my hands slapped if I um, try to push this too much, but AgeWell should have some responsive funding um, in the net in, from 2020 to 23, for when, if, if and when we're renewed, uh, to provide support to, um, to uh, Canadian researchers to um, potentially uh, work with other partners uh, abroad. Uh, we'll also be providing support to work with Canadian, with non-Canadian partners to look for funding opportunities or uh, provide that expertise to, um, to, to help you uh, collaborate internationally. Great, thank you. And just to close that, Tamea, uh, we, we work very closely with Canadian universities as uh, Andrew was describing and, and abroad. So uh, our research projects are funded through uh, 42 and, and more, I think now, uh, universities uh, across Canada. And I think we're, we're also looking to start working with colleges as well, so not just um, universities. So great, thank you everyone for your excellent questions uh, and for hanging on uh, here with us for a little bit over the three hour mark. Uh, again, I encourage you to fill out that survey that's in the chat box, register for the next webinar, and hopefully see you at our conference in Moncton. Uh, have a great rest of your day and thank you again to Andrew uh, and Lily for great presentations and discussions today. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.